Hello, everyone. Just wanted to make sure that this is working, and I see that it is. Good. Okay. So as uh, we were introduced, I know most of you here, or at least a great many of you, know uh, of Dr. Jason Fung and Megan Ramos very well. Um, I work with Dr. Fung and, and Megan at the IDM program, Intensive Dietary Management Program. And so today, I wanted to tell you a little bit ha about how I ended up here. So as I said, most of you know of these two fantastic people, but almost everyone here has no idea who this African-born, Canadian-raised, uh, Portuguese-speaking person in front of you. So. <laughs> I'll start with that, because that sounds interesting, right? So I graduated from CCNM, that's the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine, in 2004. And um, skipping ahead a few years, I started working with Megan and Jason in 2016. So what happened sort of in between? Well, basically, when I graduated in 2004, I decided that I wanted to go back to my home country, and that's Mozambique, uh, particularly Maputo, which is the city that I was born in, and Maputo is known as the Pearl of the Indic Ocean. So my whole life, I left Mozambique when I was one, but my whole life, I really just wanted to go back and work there. And so I thought I would go to Mozambique and um, help starving people, right? Like probably lots of people my age that uh, were born in Africa. That was my goal. I thought I'm gonna go and help uh, make Mozambique a better place. But unfortunately, uh, how do I put this? Complicated politics didn't allow for that. And so instead, I, it was recommended that I open a clinical, private clinical practice instead, which I did. And so for 10 years, I was basically the only person um, in my city doing um, weight loss or weight management. Uh, and so instead of helping starving people, I was helping people very much like me and you, people with metabolic syndrome that were looking for help losing weight or um, fighting off diabetes. And so I knew nothing about diet. I'm going to tell you that right off the bat. I didn't learn weight loss, diets, and naturopathic college, just like you've heard from many um, medical doctors, MDs saying the same thing. We learned very little about how uh, to help people lose weight. So basically, along those wonderful 10 years, I was very busy. I was the only person doing this in my city, and surprisingly, there was a whole lot of people looking to lose weight and um, reverse diabetes. So I learned. I had to learn through trial and error, and also because Mozambican people are wonderful and very forgiving, and they were great, uh, quote unquote, guinea pigs. Somewhere along uh, the way of those 10 years, I developed a reputation for helping women to get pregnant. I have no idea, or at least I didn't know uh, why that was happening, but what I knew was that for whatever reason, when women started following uh, a diet with me, if they had been struggling to get pregnant, somehow, miraculously, they got pregnant, uh, with a little help from the hus husbands, of course. But anyhow, so, uh, if, in fact, a lot of people didn't want to come to me because they thought that they would get pregnant if they followed my diet. <laughs> and so, I'm a big believer in karma. I still am a big believer in karma. Little did I know that a few years later, I myself would be going through the same issue. And these wonderful people um, helped me to successfully conceive and learn a lot about my own health. So, how did, how did this happen? Um, basically, I was a tiny little child, very, very small, very thin, and I grew up into a very, very thin adult. Now, this had absolutely nothing to do with a healthy diet, quite the opposite. And I'll just go ahead here and move on to this picture. And I'll, I'll tell you an aside here. As I was putting together this presentation, my husband said, is this really necessary? Do you really have to put up this picture? But I do, because it illustrates a, a very important point. Thin does not mean healthy, and this certainly was the case for me. So, uh, as a child, I, and, and even into my 30s, I never had a full proper meal, never. And my, my mother's actually here, she can confirm this. But uh, basically, I would eat very small meals and snack all day long, but not on food, on junk or 
uh, whatever I could get my hands on, whatever my family would allow me to eat. So basically, it was fruit and candy and bread and lattes with lots of sugar and lots of Coca-Cola. My country is actually known for um, people drinking more Coca-Cola than water in Mozambique. That's the case. And I, I did grow up that way, unfortunately. So I also suffered terribly from rebound hypoglycemia. So basically, I would eat all this sugar, and then uh, an hour or two later, I would be shaking because of the hyperinsulinemic response that I was creating. And again, little did I know that uh, I would develop metabolic syndrome because of this. So fast forward, and this is me in Mozambique at about 28, 29 years old. And again, I was very thin. Um, I'll also let you know that there's not an ounce of exercise that went into that body uh, because I'm very lazy. <laughs> and um, I, I, I disliked my body immensely because what I wanted was to gain weight. I wanted to be, you know, fit the, the standard of what was considered uh, a nice body. And that definitely wasn't it. So anyway, around this time, sometime after this, maybe a year or two after this, I, my husband and I started trying to conceive, and I stopped taking the pill. And unfortunately, um, about a year after that, or a bit more than that, I still hadn't successfully conceived. But what did happen in the midst of that is that my acne that I'd had as, a, as an adolescent all came back, and, and pretty, pretty fierce. I gained lots of weight very, very quickly. So by uh, 2010, I had gained close to 30 pounds. Now, mind you, my BMI was still within the normal range because I was so thin to begin with. But about this time, I started to realize that I was losing lots of hair, the acne was there, the central obesity predominantly was there, and, and I knew enough to know that something was going on and I wasn't getting pregnant, which ultimately was my goal. That's all I wanted. So went to my doctor in South Africa and finally was diagnosed with PCOS. I was totally dismissed by my doctor because I was thin. And so none of these tests were done. He never looked into this. But then when he did, surprisingly enough, I fit all three diagnostic criteria for PCOS. I had high levels of male hormones. I had polycystic ovaries on ultrasound. And I had basically stopped ovulating altogether. So at this time, the doctor prescribed clomiphene citrate, which most of you know very well, Clomid, it's first-line treatment for fertility. And I went home desperate. I, it was, uh, I remember this very well. And um, what did I know then? I knew that for whatever reason, women that came to see me got pregnant when they followed a very strict uh, diet and lost weight. So that's what I did. I went home. And I decided, if that's what it takes to get pregnant, that's what I'm going to do. And I followed the strictest of the low-carb diets that I used to give to people at the time. I used to call this a detox, quote-unquote, and it was something I didn't recommend that people do very long, for a very long time. But it was a very strict low-carb diet. And so that's what I did. My motivation was super high, and I did that. And in the very first month, I lost tons of weight. Close to six pounds, my, which for, a, you know, at the time, what I weighed wasn't all that much. That's a big percentage of, of weight loss. My acne cleared up and I started to ovulate and the very next month I was pregnant. And so my firstborn, her name is Zinzi, was born on uh, November of 2010. Now, because I didn't know Lily at the time, the speaker just before me, and I didn't get the great and wonderful advice that I, I think she's giving people, I followed no diet. Uh, during my pregnancy. I basically went back to my very, very, very poor eating, lots of candies, lots of chocolate, all day long, sugar, sugar, sugar. And just as Lily uh, mentioned, I did develop serious complications during my first pregnancy. It's not that PCOS women are infertile. PCOS women can get pregnant, and they do, just like I did. But they're, at, as we will talk a little bit later, at a much higher risk for many things. And so not only did I cause myself further damage, somebody already with metabolic syndrome, but as Lily also said, I also put my children at an increased risk for metabolic syndrome. After Zinzi was born, unfortunately, um, I developed serious and severe uh, postpartum depression, and I was medicated for that. So on top of my metabolic syndrome condition and the medication that I was on for high blood pressure, 
um, I also had to take this medication, which uh, caused me to gain 20 plus pounds in, in a very short period of time, maybe about three weeks. And now let me tell you that the, the, the two years between, or the two years post uh, my first pregnancy were a blur. I, I don't remember very much. It was, I was in a very bad place. Um, physically and mentally, I was on medication, um, and I had severe anxiety and depression. And at this point, I was overweight, uh, considered BMI, considered overweight. So two years after Zinzi was born, I developed this large ovarian cyst, and I had to have ur urgent surgical removal. It, was, it grew to be seven centimeters. Um, and my doctor, the same South African doctor, said to me, it's now or never. You either try to have another baby now, or you'll probably not have another child. Now, remember that I was in a bad place, and the thought of um, going through all that again was not, was not an easy thought. He, he prescribed uh, Clomid, and I, I was motivated. Uh, I did want another child, um, but I, didn't, I wasn't in a place mentally, or, and I didn't really know enough, really, at the time to follow any kind of diet. I didn't go back to the low-carb diet, and so I took this medication, and six months later, still no baby. And the prescription is only for six months, as many of you know, and then you can consider other things. So shortly after that, uh, I went to see a friend of mine, Dr. Carolina. She's a Mozambican uh, OBGYN. And she said this to me, of course you won't get pregnant, not even on Clomid, because you are insulin resistant. And now I promise you, this was my light bulb moment, because up until then, I had no idea why women with uh, fertility issues got pregnant once they followed a low-carb diet. But that moment was key in my life because I put all these things together. Then everything made sense. The insulin, the PCOS, the diet, the metabolic syndrome. So I walked away from my friend's office and she did prescribe metformin. So with the information that I had, once again, pregnant the very next month. Unfortunately, same sort of thing. No diet, same pregnancy complications, but my the joy of my life, my little Zuri was born on October 2013. And so you can clearly see from that picture that there's a big difference um, just overall, how I looked and how I felt between those two pictures in a very short period of time. There's only a few years between these two pictures. And so in 2013, I was at the very peak of metabolic syndrome. And um, during my pregnancy, my doctor did find a thyroid nodule, which later developed into follicular carcinoma. But when Suri was born, I was in a, a place to make a decision. And at that time, I finally decided to put all my information together. And I decided then, so that was about five years ago, to follow a uh, low-carb ketogenic diet and intermittent fasting. And within just a few months, three months, maybe even less than that, I was off all of my medication. No more hypertension medication, no more metformin, no more antidepressants. Um, my weight went back to normal. My blood glucose, A1C, even my insulin levels, which I did test, were back to, to normal. But better than all of that is that my mood and my sleep stabilized as well. And so this is us now, and um, shortly after Zuri was born, I met Dr. Fung at a conference, and I guess I harassed him enough that he let me come and work with him and Megan, and I met Megan and started working in the clinics with her. And this is my family now. Zinzi is now eight, and Zuri is five. And my husband, uh, actually, since I started working with Dr. Fung and Megan, has lost over 70 pounds because he is an avid, avid faster. Uh, the very first uh, Dr. Fung video that he watched, he went, really? This is it? Nobody ever told me this? And it's been, f it's been five years or four years since I guess he started, and he looks good. <laughs> And so let's talk a little bit about signs and symptoms of PCOS. So the central obesity, and, and many uh, women, uh, uh, generalized obesity, the menstrual and ovulatory irregularities, 
And then the expressions of hyperandrogenism, so the high male hormones, the acne, the hirsutism, the male pattern baldness, in more extreme cases, clitoral enlargement, lower tone of voice. Acanthosis nigricans, which is a dark velvety patch on skin folds, which is also seen in other insulin resistant conditions. I'm gonna quote Dr. Fung here, because I think his quotes are, and many people think his quotes are hilarious, but uh, this is not a funny one, it's a serious one. In that he said in one of our blog posts, if PCOS was just about acne and missing a few periods, then it wouldn't be so bad. And so women in premenopausal that have PCOS are prone to these reproductive issues in front of you. And supposedly, PCOS women postmenopause are at a higher risk for these very serious conditions on the right side. Now, I'll have you know that before the age of 40, I had all of the conditions in bold. And so this is, uh, again, if PCOS was just about acne and missing a few periods, then it would not be so bad. And here we have associated, you know, increased risk for cardiovascular disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, sleep apnea, depression, anxiety, cancer, type 2 diabetes, and probably many more, Alzheimer's, and et cetera, et cetera. So the diagnosis for PCOS is made when two out of the three criteria listed above, um, hyperandrogenism, oligo or irregular ovulation, and polycystic ovaries on ultrasound. This is a spectrum of disease, meaning that not all symptoms would appear in all patients. There are many expressions of PCOS, and there are, we believe, four phenotypes, ranging from the mild phenotype to the frank uh, PCOS phenotype, which is what I had, when you have all three uh, of the expressions. And so, as um, the gentleman said at the beginning, my co-speaker needs no further introduction. Um, and I'll pass it over to Dr. Fung. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. So, I admit, before I met Nadia, I really had not very much interest in PCOS. It wasn't anything I dealt with. So if you're in medicine, you know that there's sort of silos. So I was in the internal medicine silo and nephrology. So that wasn't something that we dealt with. So it was the OB gynecologist who would deal with PCOS. But what was interesting was that as we started treating people, a lot of people were getting pregnant. And so Nadia came up to me and said, well, you know, a lot of people are getting pregnant. I'm like, okay, that's kind of interesting. But then I started to look into PCOS because there's obviously a correlation to what I do talk about a lot, which is insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia. And as I sort of looked more into the pathophysiology, it just sort of struck me how illogical the whole treatment was. So I'm going to try and go over some of the pathophysiology about PCOS so you can understand it and understand how changing the diet is going to uh, improve it significantly. So if you look at uh, the three criteria, so you have anovulation as one of the big criteria, you can see that there's a clear correlation between uh, obesity and ovulation. That is, if you're the more weight you are, the less chance of ovulation. And that's one of the criteria for uh, PCOS. And uh, again, infertility is such a major part of PCOS, so even if it's not um, dangerous in itself, it puts you at high risk, but also people are spending millions of dollars on infertility treatments when really we could be changing their diets and having an impact. So you can see that at every uh, point here, whether you're sort of uh, normal weight, overweight, or obese, PCOS has way more infertility, like 70, uh, you know, 80%. And this is, uh, again, PCOS, you see this clear correlation with obesity. So as you move from underweight to obese, you see that there's definitely a lot more. So 
the same thing happens with uh, type 2 diabetes. So there's just a lot more insulin resistance, impaired glucose tolerance, as well as uh, frank type 2 diabetes in people with uh, PCOS. And the cost is not really insignificant because if you look at the economic burden of PCOS, it's sort of huge, right? So this is the annual cost in millions of dollars. Um, so the total cost, which is sort of staggering, is like $4.37 billion spent on treating a condition that I think is mostly not treated uh, very well. So the question is why? So there's sort of those three criteria. One of the big ones is this hyperandrogenemia. So basically, people have too much testosterone, and that's what causes the acne, the facial hair, and, you know, the bearded lady sort of um, pattern. And the question is why do they develop too much testosterone? And so if you look at the pathophysiology, you can see that the testosterone, which is the main androgen in the body, is sort of produced by two places. It's produced by the adrenal gland and it's produced by the ovaries. So when they look at where people are producing too much of the testosterone, it's clearly coming from the ovaries. So it's not an adrenal problem, it's an ovarian problem. And the other thing that is contributing to this hyperandrogenemia is the low sex hormone binding globulin, which is made in the liver. So what that is, it's a binding protein to the testosterone. So normally in the blood, uh, testosterone doesn't circulate very much as a free uh, um, molecule. So it's bound up with this sex hormone binding globulin. And when there's not enough of this uh, sex hormone binding globulin, then you have more of the free testosterone, which is free to sort of make its effect. So it's just like if you think about, you know, if you're at a baseball game and everybody gets out and everybody wants to take a taxi and go home. Well, if there's not enough taxis, then everybody just kind of mills around. It's the same thing here. So the testosterone should be bound to this binding globulin. If there's not enough of it, everything, every, all the testosterone is just sort of milling around and that's where you get the acne and all the other things. So the question is, why do you have too much testosterone? And the answer is insulin. Um, so you can see from studies that they've done that the higher uh, insulin you get, the more testosterone you get. And there's a um, effect on the liver as well that if you have more insulin, you're gonna have lower uh, levels of this uh, binding globulin. So if you look at it from a causal standpoint, you've got too much insulin, which leads to this hyperandrogenism, which is both too much testosterone and not enough of this binding globulin, which is leading to the masculine, uh, masculinizing features. The second major criteria of polycystic ovarian syndrome is polycystic ovaries, right? So that, that on the picture on the left is a normal ovary. On the right, you have all these cysts. And the question is, why are these cysts developing? So, this is um, a picture of the normal sort of menstrual cycle. Um, so if you, if you look at the normal ovaries, that picture there, what you can see is that over the normal menstrual cycle, you have a development of the, you know, the, um, the, the ovary develops the egg, which is released at the end there, and then it sort of involutes, okay? So what the cysts are, are their follicular cysts. So if you look at the polycystic ovary, you see they haven't ovulated yet. They're sort of stuck in that phase before ovulation. And that's why all these cysts develop. So because you're not ovulating, you're not going to get pregnant because that egg doesn't come out of the ovary. It doesn't travel to the uterus where the sperm meets it. So everything is stuck at that uh, pre-ovulation level. And there's a lot of them. So that's why you get the ovary. That's why you get all those cysts in the ovary. And the reason for that is something called follicular arrest. So normally, if you look at the uh, A diagram, what you get is uh, sort of this uh, developing follicle. And then you get this surge of hormone, which is LH. And then you get a pre-ovulatory follicle. That's the normal development. If you have too much insulin, so if you look at uh, the B section, so under the influence of too much insulin, uh, these follicles actually become too sensitive to the hormone. So before you get this LH surge, they've already developed, and then you get the arrest of the follicles. 
In other words, they're stopping at a level which is about eight millimeters before they get to that stage where they're big enough to ovulate, which is sort of 10 to 15 centimeters. And this is the reason that you have all these follicles stuck at that pre-ovulatory stage. And the ultimate cause, of course, is too much insulin. That's the bottom line. Too much insulin is causing the follicular arrest, which is causing all the cysts in the polycystic ovaries. So once again, if you look at the pathophysiology of what's happening, is that you've got the polycystic ovaries, which is caused by too much insulin. You've got the too much testosterone, which is caused by too much insulin. And the third thing is the anovulatory cycles. So, and, and that's of course caused because if you have the follicular arrest, you don't get the release. So everything is caused by too much insulin. So this obviously is really, really important because it overlaps with everything that we see clinically, which is that too much insulin or hyperinsulinemia is also very important for the development of obesity and type 2 diabetes, which are huge uh, health issues that are clearly correlated to the presence of PCOS. And it's clear, it's obvious to see why, because they're all caused by the same underlying disease of hyperinsulinemia. These are all diseases of too much insulin. So what you see is that um, in PCOS, so if we, we kind of go beyond the fertility issues and the sort of acne and so on, what you see is that there's a huge spectrum of disease you know, cardiovascular disease, sleep apnea, non-alcoholic fatty liver, which is that picture of the liver, insulin resistance, uh, type 2 diabetes, and so on. And all of them are really diseases of too much insulin. And it's not like nobody knows this stuff. So this is a review article from the New England Journal of Medicine. And in a very nice, fancy picture, it shows you exactly what the problem is with PCOS. So if you look at the picture, the, the key is the hyperinsulinemia. You can see that the hyperinsulinemia goes down to the ovary, which tells it to you know, produce more um, androgens. It blocks the sex hormone, uh, the SHBG, the sex hormone binding globulin on the left, and it causes the obesity and so on. But again, this is pretty easy to understand that everything here is really a disease of too much insulin. And this is the part that sort of logic just breaks down. Because in medical school, you learn about all this stuff, and it's like, okay, well, if too much insulin causes everything that you see in PCOS, then what's the treatment? How about Clomid? It's like, okay, like, <laughs> did you not pay attention here? <laughs> Too much insulin was the problem. Why are you giving Clomid, which stimulates the ovary to, uh, you know, ovulate? It's like, how about an ovarian wedge resection? It's like, uh, what? What are you talking about? Right, so ovarian wedge resection was this sort of old-time treatment for PCOS, where they'd actually slice a little wedge you know, like a little piece of watermelon out of your ovary. And that was a treatment for PCOS. And why did it work? Because if you slice a little wedge out of your ovary, your ovary cannot produce as much of the testosterone. So a lot of the symptoms would get better. But again, you're not making the actual disease better. Because you never actually treated the hyperinsulinemia. Or you can go to other treatments like Metformin sort of makes little sense, but how about birth control pills? It's like, is that going to reduce your insulin? <laughs> if it doesn't, then what are you doing for this disease? Like, you gotta go back to the root cause of the disease and fix it if you wanna fix this disease. And the disease is so common <laughs> and causes so much heartache that we treat it sort of in, in this crazy manner when we already know what the root cause of this disease is. It's like, it's um, too much insulin, so let's reduce insulin.
That's the only logical treatment, which is why Nadia works with patients and says, oh, hey, all of them are getting pregnant. Um, and it's like, it, it sort of makes sense why that is. So everything ultimately comes down to it, but if you look, this is a sort of standard um, treatment uh, guideline. Uh, and again, this is what they tell medical students and family doctors and everybody. So here's the symptoms, and if you look at the treatment, it's fertility drugs, right? Fertility drugs, if you want birth control pills, uh, insulin secreting medications like like glucophage, so that's, that's an old uh, medication of sulfonylurea where you would, uh, sorry, um, metformin, which sensitizes you to the insulin, which makes a little sense, and IVF and stimulating drugs. It's like, okay, where in this all have you actually thought about the actual disease and what we're doing for this disease? Like, obviously, this is not the answer. And again, it's billions of dollars from the pockets of all these women and it's sort of heartbreaking to hear all these stories of women who want to get pregnant and can't get pregnant, so they go to their you know, fertility specialist who says, you have PCOS, let me give you some IVF for you know, $10,000 at a cycle. It's like, come on, like, we can do better than this. This is not what we went to medical school for, right? This is not science. You gotta understand the path of physiology, then you treat it. How are you going to treat it? Well, obviously, if insulin is too high, then you got to lower insulin. And there's no drug that really does a great job of, of, of doing that. And that's why the drug treatments really are not that good. But what is fantastic is that you don't need drugs for this condition, right? You need to understand the disease and then treat it. So how are you going to do it? Low carbohydrate diets ketogenic diets, intermittent fasting. All of them, at their heart, are reducing insulin. They're just trying to lower the amount of insulin. If you don't eat, your insulin's gonna go down. If you eat very low carbohydrate diets, ketogenic diets, your insulin is gonna go down. And that's all it is. It's so simple, yet, you know, to say stuff like this, you know, you come across as some sort of really wacky guy that shouldn't be talking about women's health because, hey, you're a nephrologist, right? So, uh, you know, I, 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 this was very eye-opening for me just to see that, hey, this is not something that is, we shouldn't be siloed like this in medicine. These are diseases that need treatment, understand the cause, and then you can come up with a rational treatment, just like in cancer, for example, where IGF-1 is gonna make a big difference, well, hey, if insulin is a growth factor, maybe we should think about <laughs> lowering insulin a little bit. Like, maybe that might help. It's the same idea. So this is why, why uh, conferences like this are really so important, because it allows us to explore these ideas that sort of exist outside of the mainstream medicine, but why they should out exist outside the mainstream of medicine uh, really shouldn't be. Thank you very much.